Hey, everyone. I'm here with co-host David Figler and newsletter editor Scott Dickensheets. And today on CityCast Las Vegas, we're talking about Siegfried and Roy's jungle-themed mansion, a lawsuit over kids who vape, and the bill that sparked uproar in the craft brew community. It's Friday, March 10th. I'm Vogue Robinson, and here's what Las Vegas is talking about. Good morning, David and Scott. How are y'all doing? Hey there, Scott and Vogue. I'm doing good. This is David. (laughs) (laughs) I'm Scott, and I'm doing well. Last night, I went to see Frozen uh, at the Smith Center. It was opening night, and wow, what a treat. The staging and the the lighting effects and so on were were like genius level. I've never seen anything quite like it. Mm -hmm. And of course, there was this this great little moment during the uh, rendition of Let It Go when all the little kids in the audience were singing along. Mm. And it was like such a sweet little moment, I gotta say. I love that. It melted my my Disney cynical heart for a minute. <laughs> Do you have a Disney cynical heart, Scott? Oh, I don't like Disney at all. I mean, oh. everybody really oh. should if you <laughs> if you analyze it. You too, Vogue. Oh my. Oh no, gosh. I have a love hate. Like I, I I've I've got a book coming about about my love hate relationship with Disney. I don't play, um, but I play. <laughs> so here we go. I'm neutral, but I'm feeling like I should hate. Neutral. I mean, yeah, it's like Disney. <laughs> <laughs> That's it. That's all I got. Disney. Well, let, let's get to things that are not neutral. Let's all right, talk about zippity doo da. My oh my, it's a settlement day. So Clark County School District is going to consider a nine point five million dollar settlement with the e-cigarette maker Jewel. I feel like this has been going on for like three plus years. But David, can you break this down for us, please? Um. So yeah, in twenty fifteen. Some smarty pantses came up with some technology to be able to uh, get nicotine into the bodies of humans much more efficiently and hipper and cooler after, you know, all the backlash from smoking. Hot takes, David. Hot takes. And um, apparently the allegation is that they might have marketed to young people with their bright colors and their attractive spokespeople, making it look even super duper hipper and that maybe- And they said the flavors too. They were like, oh, strawberry, blue raz, oh my. Mango. Mango. You know, the kids love the mango these days. Well, you know, I was looking through some documents and stuff and the three flavors that they were were, that they were citing as being like obviously kids love it. I'm thinking what, cotton candy or something? Uh, it was mango, <laughs> mint, and creme brulee because, of course, oh. it is the fad. It's it's TikTok all over again. The refined palette. the creme brulee challenge. <laughs> anyway, anyways, so yeah, they're marketing. Uh, the allegations they're marketing to children. They're kind of shielding the idea that this is something alternative to smoking. Side note: the the big money behind Jewel, uh, uh, an investor, were the same people who are the big money behind Marlboro. So. You know, it's the same damn company. It's like repeating history in a certain way. So a number of school districts, and when I say a number of school districts, hundreds and hundreds of school districts across the country sued Jewel. Jewel went through bankruptcy. They're also getting sued by states, including Nevada. So they're getting hit from all directions. Lawyers have ads on TV. You know, were your children harmed by vaping? (laughs) You know, and call this phone number. So the lawyers are making tons and tons and tons of money, as they should, because lawyers do hard work and um, call out, you know, bad things in 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 society for gain. Go figure. What's weird about the settlement, guys, is that like the details are all a mystery. <laughs> the it's on the school board agenda to like consider it, but like there's no documents attached. And what we do know is five million dollars is already like of this bigger settlement of fourteen million dollars mm-hmm. was already allocated for fees and agreements, which more or less means costs and lawyers. Scott, you're you're my age. Was smoking such a bad thing when you were a kid? <laughs> well, as I recall, in high school was, I don't know, you know, three geological epochs ago for me, but mm-hmm. I mean there was a there was like a designated smoking area in the in the quad right? or something. So there was a time when 
when the, the official stance toward it was like, you know, grudgingly acknowledging that kids are going to do it and there's no way to stop them. Mm. Things have changed, apparently, and vaping has that sort of veneer of cool to it or not smoking, smoking. So you know, it's just one of those things that, that schools have to deal with now. Right. In my head, though, growing up, so I'm of the D.A.R.E. generation, okay? So since, like, fifth, sixth grade, it was D.A.R.E., okay? I had my shirt, right, wrote a nice little poem about not smoking. <laughs> So it was it was very different. And what's interesting to me is that this isn't the first lawsuit that's come up against any type of smoking. There was another one that was just as big that they the smoking companies were or the companies that manufactured cigarettes were targeted. It was a one big ass lawsuit. And then they just cut the check. My question is, where is this money going <laughs> after they yeah. get it? Yeah. Uh, how will it be spent? And and why is it that the school district that they're the ones suing as opposed to the the p- parents of the families of kids who are impacted. That doesn't make sense to me. It's kind of an all of the above, right? So everybody's suing these vaping companies. They have thousands of lawsuits. So some are coming from government, some are coming from people themselves. Where the money goes is always kind of interesting. And the school district gets involved because, you know, they deal with issues of policing and all the stuff that happens in the school and they have to educate kids and kids ostensibly get sick because, you know, they get addicted to nicotine or they have health risks that are associated with vaping or smoking and stuff. So I I think that the the concept and maybe we'll we'll hear more from the school district what to do with this, you know, little honeypot of money that's come their way Hmm. is for education, maybe even detection. I guess there are like vape detectors that they could put in the bathrooms and stuff like that, that that's a technology that exists out there education, that sort of thing. I mean, that's usually where it goes, and that stuff disappears, uh, dare I say, like a puff of vape. (laughs) I just think it's interesting that this is on the consent agenda for the school district, which means it's just one of a a bunch of items they'll pass in one fell swoop unless somebody pulls it out and demands it be talked about. So I think that's interesting that there's no vision being presented for what to do with the money. I'm sure it'll just disappear smoothly into the cracks and crevices of the bureaucracy as tends to happen, I think. So, Scott, I mean, in your brain, if you were trying, if you were put in charge, (laughs) let's let's put Scott in charge. (laughs) How would you want to solve the youth vaping problem? What would be the the wildest way? How would I solve it? Mm -hmm. (laughs) You're asking the wrong guy. But I I will say I'm not, you know, public policy is not really my bag. But I will say this is part and parcel of a larger trend of putting the onus on schools to help deal with social issues. I mean, frankly, the problem belongs in the laps of parents, and and as do so many issues that that schools are tasked to solve these days. Mm-hmm. Let one kid cyber bully another kid, and everybody's going to turn to the school to figure out why that's happening, even though both kids are on their personal phones at home when it happens. The school is only marginally involved because that's where the kids' lives intersect. But so the school is tasked to deal with it. I think Mm -hmm. the same thing here. The proper arena for, you know, controlling vaping among kids is the home, I think. But reality says you got to attack it where they are as well, and that's schools. And so how I would use that money to attack it, I don't know. I don't think awareness campaigns really help with, with teenagers. I just don't, having raised some and been one. But I'm sure smarter people than me know what they're doing. We'll see. We shall see. Let's move on to uh, to more things being regulated by the government. Th- this is starting to to show me how much I'm like, do I want the government's hands in everything? Like, ooh, all my views are changing, you guys. <laughs> Yeah, that Nevada way. So the breweries and the distributors are clashing over a newly proposed bill. And so I got to dig through uh, an article written by Jacob Solis in the Nevada Independent about the way that the laws are now. A beer that's brewed in Henderson has to be sold to a distributor. And then that brewery then has to buy the beer back at a markup so that they can serve it in their own tasting room in Las Vegas, which is like a weird triangulation, but it's set up that way because the 1933 post-prohibition 
the three tiered system was created. And that was so that you could, there was a separation between suppliers. So your breweries and your wineries, your distributors, whoever's driving it from point A to point B, and then your real retailers, all three things had to be separated. And so my understanding is this was done to keep a level playing field, but it doesn't really feel that way. The bill, which was proposed by um, Democratic Senator Rochelle Nguyen, um, she wants the, the craft breweries to be able to move products from their breweries to their tasting rooms or tap rooms and pulling out that middle middleman, if you will, of the distributor. And so the distributor also is called the wholesaler sometimes. But the the current arrangement is to me, it feels like trash, but maybe I'm missing, you know, a, a component of this that makes it make sense. But to me, it feels very antiquated. I got to say, the three tier system sounds at first blush like a middleman protection uh, legislation. And the distributors have a lot of money to, to spread around in political campaigns and so on. So uh, Yo, that, that... Yeah, surprise may, that might <laughs> impact the, the continued existence of this three tier system. Right. I'm going to pull those numbers for you because that was like the big thing that I noticed, too, was like their contributions are here we go. Per the article, the state's wholesalers are perennially among the top campaign donors to Nevada lawmakers from the alcohol industry, often giving legislators from both parties tens of thousands of dollars in contributions. So, yeah. (laughs) Are these arcane rules? Of course, they're arcane rules. Is there a justification for still having them? It's a bit protectionist. And will the world fall apart if this new law is passed? No. Will it make things easier for some? Yes. Will some people be financially damaged? Yes. Are the arguments that are being raised is that you need this three tier to basically have in a checks and balance system? Are those legitimate arguments? Potentially, there's going to be abuse in a system where there are gaps, where there are loopholes. Sure, sure, sure. Does this solve it? Ish. <laughs> David, not really. you're, you're jaded is like. No, I mean, seeping. this is what it's all about. <laughs> this is the same thing with cannabis, right? When they decided to do their thing, they looked at alcohol and how alcohol did it. And, you know, people who distribute make money distributing and, and they have their own regulations, their own rules and things like that. And so that was thought in the modern era to be a good system to try to replicate. Also didn't really work out. So I, I get I do get both sides of it. I understand why this is a pain in the butt for some of these breweries because they're really trying to be innovative and trying to do stuff and trying to stay profitable. And then they have this extra expense. And I understand why the others are saying, no, you really do need this to make sure, sure, sure that alcohol is not exploited because alcohol, like cigarettes, like everything else, is just evil inherently. And people will, you know, exploit a system to their own gain. And what we really need, Vogue, is prohibition of everything. Las Vegas needs to turn into little Utah, not little Amsterdam. So one of the things the article pointed out was that, you know, on a quick Google search, there's 250 craft brewers in Seattle, in the city. And we have 51 craft breweries in our entire state. So there's clearly a huge difference that these laws, the current laws are making in, in whether or not breweries can expand and grow. I guess from you guys' perspective, you know, what does a thriving local beer scene do for a bar or for a city? What are your thoughts on that, Scott? Well, I think the more thriving the local craft bar scene is, the more thriving, you know, it it adds another element to the localness of a place, the distinctiveness of a place. And I'm all in favor of that for sure. Mm -hmm. Keep in mind, though, that, you know, Seattle was the birthplace of grunge. So, of course, there's going to be a lot of beer there. Um, (laughs) But no, I, I do think that... Also a lot of coffee there. Also a lot of coffee. I do think that, as with all things cultural, the more you can localize it and particularize it to a place, the more it helps people, you know, consumers and so on, bond with that place. Because it doesn't feel like you're drinking some generic beer from, you know, from across the country, you know, made by robots or something. So... <laughs> No to robot beer. You know, we have a vibrant beer scene here. This is like a weird technical glitch in the the flow of of money and beer. And I'm sure it'll all work out. But, you know, both sides are not poor. They're both going to yell. And eventually the legislature has to come down on which side it's going to help a little better. Right. It's going to be interesting. Let's 
talk about lifestyles of the rich and famous. Let's talk about Siegfried and Roy's mansion that is apparently on market and it is, uh, it's wild. <laughs> Scott, I feel like you were fascinated with this. Please break it down. <laughs> well, sure. Who? I mean, who wouldn't be? It's Siegfried and Roy and they're, you know, one of the pillars of the modern Las Vegas entertainment scene, known for their sort of garish over the topness on stage and off. And so there is definitely a little bit of a voyeur's you know, a sizzle to looking at the photos of this, you know, jungle palace, as it's called. <laughs> you know, it's pretty interesting. It's 8,700 square feet and has two bedrooms. <laughs> so, you know, you so What? Yeah, two bedrooms. Um, it does have a guest house in a cabana. It's got <laughs> custom stained glass. It's got a variety of murals. It's got, you know, I think three pools and an indoor jacuzzi and a, a bird sanctuary. If you... There's a shot of one of the bedrooms, and there's a right behind the bed where the headboard would be. There's a, a giant sort of life-size, photorealistic image of an elephant. Don't know what you're signaling there, but anyway, there it is. <laughs> and there's some there's some tufted, tasseled material hanging from the ceiling. In a way, it's sort of as, exactly as kitschy and garish as you might expect it to be. I have to say, I couldn't help as I looked through the photos, wondering like. Where do they put the giant kitty litter box? That's what I want to know. <laughs> I don't think it works that way for the big cats. Well, I mean, uh, I guess you just let them go wherever they want. You're going to tell them otherwise, Ma? <laughs> <laughs> so it looks like this house, it's $3 million. $3 million. <laughs> A bargain. Built in 1954, and it's on Zillow, y'all. You know, you could, you could get this 8,750 square foot property. <laughs> It's got trees galore. It's a there's sort of this opulent lushness about the whole thing, and there's a poignance to it too. I have to say, you know, Siegfried and Roy had been around Vegas for a while, but they really came into their own around 1990 with at the Mirage, so at the birth of the mega resort era. And if you recall, that was a garish time too. They were building pyramids and castles and replicas of Oz and all this cartoonish, over the top architecture which, you know, sort of later sort of morphed into a more generic sense of luxury. And now all the hotels look like they could be office buildings in Houston. Mm. And so Siegfried and Roy and their their passings in 2020 and 2021, I think, kind of closes the book in a way on that era of Vegas mm. as this super gaudy, over-the-top, the tackiness intensified of Las Vegas. <laughs> and so there's to me, there's kind of a, you know, a... A poignant note to that. That makes sense. I could see that. I'm sad I missed the garish days. I, I wouldn't have been above it. Um, all I'm going to say is this. Siegfried and Roy rose from legend to myth in our community. There wasn't anyone who lived here who didn't know of, I would say that they were probably our most famous residents at one point, to you know, over-the-top entertainers. They had been around for ever they were at the old frontier then like scott says elevated with the mirage really out in the community people had their thoughts about them there were apocryphal tales there were literal myths about them that roy had died years before the mm. unfortunate uh, montecore attack and had been replaced by a sequence of of new roys and roy clones i mean it was outlandish and crazy what? i don't know if you remember in 1996 there was even a siegfried and roy cartoon. Oh, I do. <laughs> Masters of the Impossible. I think it's something like that. When the dust demons are swept from the hearth and the kindling's been set ablaze, the mages sit by the fire and recall a once magic world called Sarmoti. And they were like action adventure heroes with the accents and they didn't do the accents other other people did, but I mean it was it was so much. Mm. They are indeed insistent are they not meant to call. Jupiter, come quickly. I need you. The bus were considered to be public art, the ones of Siegfried and Roy that were outside the Mirage. And I, I don't know that it's still there. And I don't know if the new owners, the Hard Rock, are going to keep them. But they should, because what's more Vegas rock and roll than, you know, two foreigners who have really large cats, some of whom are deadly? doing magic <laughs> come on it's everything oh. so it is sad that it is that kind of the end of the chapter 
Uh, but you know, all all things in Las Vegas, especially, must pass. So Siegfried and Roy will pour out some schnapps for you, and uh, <laughs> hopefully, the house will go into good hands and not flippers. Oh, can you imagine what a flipper would do with how many square feet was that? <laughs> Eighty seven hundred no, over over eight thousand. Yeah. yeah, a lot a lot of visits to Home Depot. A lot of gray hardwood flooring. Yeah, gray hardwood flooring. Oh, right. Oh no, travesty. I don't know. I feel like they should. I want. I want like. 15 tours before it's closed like i want i want it to open up for tours before they fully do whatever they're going to do with it but maybe maybe they'll have open houses if they have an open house david we're going all right i'm in yes scott do you want to come oh absolutely absolutely okay cool we'll bring the family it'll be a selfie bonanza (laughs) siegfried and roy just two ordinary guys trying to make an honest buck Hmm, a tale as old as time <laughs> well David and Scott I'll see y'all when we meet up at Sacred and Roy's house for the tour thank you so much for a wonderful conversation this morning thank you thanks Vogue and I, I have so much to take away don't vape don't have large cats around you often and the flagon with the dragon has the brew that is true if anyone gets that reference send that to Scott care of Scott <laughs> That's all for today here on CityCast Las Vegas. Our lead producer is Sonia Cho Swanson. Our producer is Layla Muhammad. Our newsletter editor is Scott Dickensheets. And our hosts are David Figler and myself, Vogue Robinson. Music is by OG Moose and All the Kimonos. We record this show on the traditional homelands of the new movie, the Southern Paiute people. If you enjoyed the show, go ahead and tell a friend, rate the show, leave us a review, and subscribe to our morning newsletter. We'll be back Monday morning with more news from around the city. Take care. Scott, do you remember your first beer? No. Legend has it that as a child at my parents' wedding, I was 18 months old or so, but uh, legend has I staggered around from guest to guest imbibing from whatever drinks they were they were having and of course at the time back in the in the 60s i guess you shared with a kid i don't know but that was my first i I would watch that baby boozer sitcom (laughs) all all season it's like a little bearded baby so it's like bearded baby scott crawling okay we have to move on you guys (laughs)